So welcome to the conventional and digitally guided full arch rehabilitation webinar. It is being presented by our very own Jeff Carlson, CDT, and we will begin the webinar shortly. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Carlson, CDT. He has extensive experience in both the dental laboratory setting, as well as working with dental implant manufacturers in the areas of education and technical and sales support. He has lectured both nationally and internationally on dental implants. Jeff is the primary author of a 300-page fully illustrated cookbook for restorative doctors and is a co-author of a corresponding restorative manual for auxiliaries that has been distributed in eight countries. Jeff has also developed a two-day training program helping clinicians improve their presentation skills, which has been attended by more than 200 dentists from 16 countries. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Jeff. Wow. All, all on X immediate load protocol and the digital guided full arch rehabilitation protocol, which uh, is very a, a wonderful treatment modality to be offering your patients. And so let's just get right into it. Um, first off, I do need to make a quick disclosure that uh, I am a full time employee of NDX in sequence laboratory. I am a, actually the senior implant specialist for NDX, Labor NDX and Sequence Laboratory. So really what I think we're gonna be talking about a lot tonight is how we're gonna be minimizing variables really through the science and through a systematic approach for this full arch treatment, re treatment modality. And I think the key is that it's minimizing variables there to my understanding and my experience, there's there's no way to possibly eliminate all the variables, uh, but we really have been able to minimize a lot of the variables. So to really get started with an in-sequence full arch case, there's really only five pieces of information required. The key though, is that really to follow the details in as far as how the records are to be taken uh, very specifically, um, we're going to go through each of those steps because if the records that you send in the laboratory do not meet the level that we need, then you're going to be receiving an email requesting um, either additional information or redoing some of the information, and that's going to do nothing but put the case behind, and we definitely don't want to be doing that. So it is very imperative that you follow the, the guidelines that we have laid out for record taking, because this is really the key part uh, of the system. So there's really five pieces of information that's required. Of course, one's gonna be the uh, CBCT scan, and we're gonna go into the detail of all these. And then uh, we need a bite registration, and we're gonna talk both about analog bite registrations as well as digital bite registrations. And then the models, again, digital or analog models, be it impressions or stone cast. And then for sure, there's a series of a minimum of five views that we're looking for for photos of your patient. We'll talk again in more detail of those. And then the last piece of information we need is the prescription to be completed. So these five pieces of information um, is what's going to get your case started once everything is submitted. Please note that if you are working in a team environment, meaning that you are, say, you're the restorative clinician, and you're working with a specialist that if the specialist is sending in a CBCT scan um, and any other maybe potential information and you as a restorative clinician are also sending this information in, maybe it's the bite registration uh, or the, or the, um, the iOS um, information from scans, maybe the photos, um, your case does not start until all the information is received. So I say this to our, our specialists, to our surgical friends, that if you submit and you think the case is, the clock has started, um, it hasn't until we receive all the information from the restorative doctors. And this is something very important that maybe you do a quick pulse check with them and make sure and help keep them on track that they're getting their information in as well. Because once again, 
if there's a delay in getting the information from one of the parties, the case the, the, the case will be delayed uh, essentially is what's gonna happen with that. So let's get into talking about the records that we need and, and how to best capture these records. We have on our website as well, it's available for, from downloadable PDFs, are these um, little cheat sheets or cliff notes, if you will, for the five key things that we need for the uh, records. The fifth one is being is the prescription. As you see, uh, this is the front and back of a, of a PDF that we've created. Um, on the right, you're gonna see here that this is going to give you, uh, this again is the cliff notes. The things we're gonna share with you tonight are uh, the key points are listed here on these. We encourage you to uh, download the PDF from our website and then even print it. And some people will even uh, laminate them, keep them in a drawer. So when um, patients come in, maybe the assistant has it laying out, just to kind of keep everyone on track. Um, if that's needed. They are available for the partially dentate patient, fully dentate patient, and then the fully dentulous uh, patient as well. So there's going to be um, the three different uh, PDFs that are going to help you to stay on track with capturing the appropriate records. So to kind of look at that in a little more detail, this particular one is for a fully dentate patient. Um, here you're going to see that it reminds you about the CT scans that we're going to get into, uh, the impressions, bite registrations, uh, and then the photos. And so this is on the back side of that PDF with more in-depth information. So we've got our five pieces of information. They're submitted in the lab, and many times people think, hey, that's great. Now we're off and running. And unfortunately, maybe we're not always there just yet because there's sometimes uh, based on the complexity of your case, there's additional information that's very advantageous to have. Um, you know, even um, more photos than just the five that we're going to be talking about as well. Um, for an example, you know, the photos that we're looking for, I think if you focus on trying to capture the photo of your patient about two inches or so outside of the ears and at least two, three inches below the chin, top of the forehead, uh, you don't want to take a photo from your patient, you know, from six, eight feet away. And then at the laboratory, if we're zooming in and we lose some of the clarity, that can be a, a little bit of a challenge. So to say to a patient, give me a big smile, because as many of you know, your patients have, your patients will have what's referred to Patients, as you know, will have what's referred to as a guarded smile. They're not happy with their smile. They've learned how to smile big without showing teeth. So as many times as you say smile big, they can smile big and not even see anything. What we're looking for, uh, some people refer to it as the Duchenne smile, uh, where you have the largest smile possible. What you're wanting to do, uh, encourage your patient to even like squint their eyes but how high can they bring their upper lip uh, physically? That not, not saying just in a natural smile, but how high can they possibly bring that? Because that is where is going to help us to identify the transition line. And the transition line is extremely important with these type of restorations because that transition, transition line is where the prosthesis meets the alveolar ridge. And that needs to be kept hidden from uh, from view. And so what we've learned doing this for over 12 years now and thousands of cases, that we found the transition line is if we keep that three millimeters above the highest smile position, the highest lip line position, that we're able to maintain uh, that transition line hidden from the patient, as well as prevent their lips. Sometimes if you don't have the transition line high enough, the patient smiles, their lip can get actually caught, caught on the prosthesis. And that's not a good thing, of course. So that's what we're looking for is a high smile. So, um, you know, it's fine to take a, a smile, a photo of patients, a natural smile, but definitely get that high smile as well. So five, five images or five views are really the minimum. The more, the better. Um, when we ask for more information, I'll be talking too about analog and digital. Sometimes it's a good idea to go ahead and do both. Uh, patients 
have high expectations with these type of restorations and they're paying, you know, they're spending a significant amount of money. And so the more information that you can provide to the laboratory, it's just going to allow us to help meet and exceed your expectations and your patient's expectations. Um, lips parted. We like to see that low relaxed lip line. Some people just have a patient say, you know, MMM or Alabama, Alabama, relax, and then take that photo. We're looking to see where the incisal edge is. As you know, based on the age of a patient, sometimes uh, where you want to put the incisal edge of the teeth can be more of a youthful look. Um, the retracted frontal, now we got three retracted images that we really would like to see. And these images would also be whether you're using um, occlusal rims, say the patient that has natural dentition anteriorly, but you're using posterior uh, occlusal rims, uh, you'd want the rims in place. Um, if it's um, bite blocks, let's say, uh, for a fully dentulous arch or a double arch in a fully dentulous patient, we still would like to see that. The reason that that is, is because we can look at the image, the photos that you send, and then also when we get the, whether it's the scans or impressions, models, what have you, it's called cross-validation. We're able to look at the photos, and if we see something in a photo that's different than what we see, maybe from the, the articulation, the models from a bite that you sent us, but we see here, looking at your photos, the patient has a different occlusal relationship, then that would be a, a trigger for us to reach out to you to say, you know, doctor, which one, you know, which is correct here before we move forward. We will not guess at things because we've learned um, that if we guess or we um, accept records that we know are not up to the standard that's needed, the information isn't really quite there. It's not like a crown is high, a contact's heavy, a margin's open. If we make a mistake or, or allow a, state, a mistake to be made because of accepting inaccurate or inadequate, maybe a better way to say it, records, um, a patient could be hurt. You know, in, implants could come out the buccal or, or lingual plates, um, maybe unfortunately go into the sinus or, or nerve. Um, so it's, it's very important that the records that we're talking about are very accurate records and detailed records. And when in doubt, you know, um, do an extra few of extra photos. Um, if you're doing just a digital scan for the bite, maybe just go ahead and do a, a, a physical uh, blue moose bite as well. And we'll talk more about bites coming up. Uh, the retracted ones, what we're looking, the retracted photos, we want to be able to see, again, the clues of relationship. Um, it also helps us in aligning the models to make sure that what we're doing digitally is matching up to what we see here. So photos are very important. Um, you don't need a fancy camera. We know for a fact with today's uh, iPhones and um, um, can't think of the Samsung, the Samsung phones, et cetera, that you can get fantastic photos. So it's not necessary to uh, buy a new, a new camera by any means. So impressions, we're going to talk about both the digital impressions and analog impressions. So I want to talk about the analog impressions at first. So um, really you want to be doing PBS impressions, uh, it's going to be more, more accurate. Um, again, we're looking for detailed information. And the key to this is that some people don't think about it, is that when they're taking an impression, because we're basically going to be making a bridge, but we need to have an impression as if you were going to be making a denture. And the reason I say that is you want to have the ability for the laboratory to fabricate you a backup denture. Now, with all the information you're going to see that we're going to be able to um, share with you as far as bone density, uh, the drilling guides, et cetera, and your experience understanding about the tactile feel of, of bone density through your drilling protocols. Even with maybe six implants being placed, it may happen that if a patient does have that very soft D4 or, or call it a D5 bone, um, that you may not be able to load the case. So uh, patients definitely don't want to leave with no teeth. They don't want to leave with a denture either, but at least they leave with a smile. And um, so it's very important that when you do your impressions that you take a full arch impression as if you're going to do a denture. 
And I would encourage you to do even, you know, border molding. You don't necessarily need to do a custom impression tray. Uh, some of you that want to, you're welcome to do that, of course. Um, but you do want to capture a Hamler notches, the palatine fovea. Again, the, the anatomy that we capture there is going to help us to just validate, again, between models, between CT scans, between STL uh, files from your, um, from your scanners, et cetera. So um, when it comes to the digital, this is something that's very important, that when you're scanning, to turn off the artificial intelligence, the AI setting on your, um, on your scanner, because it will automatically be trimming as you go. And what I mean by trimming is, is you see that image there, it's a horseshoe. And what software does is it wants to, you know, it's, it, it's capturing it for a bridge basically, but the more data that you have, the, uh, the voxels that you have, the more pixels that you have, that's data and it can slow software down. So this artificial intelligence, what it does, it trims the way the, the excess, if you will, so that the, the data is more user-friendly within the software. Well, we, don't, we want to have the full information, all the borders, the full palatal area, the retromolar pads, uh, et cetera, because that way we can make the denture from that. And then at the laboratory, we will do the trimming of the scan so that when it goes into the software to manipulate it for the design of the case, um, we're able to, to work through that more effectively and efficiently. Yet we still, if we need to, we can go back to the original documentation that we have, the original record that we have, and have that to fabricate the denture. So um, key things are about just scanning for, for a denture, turning off the AI, impressioning again as if you're going to be making a denture. When it comes to the digital uh, byte registration, people want to be, you know, do everything digital. And um, the phrase you see here is called, this is more of an internal um, phrase that uh, actually, um, Termaine Watkins, our uh, director of guided surgery for NDX, uh, kind of coined this phrase. I really like this phrase, um, cast collision. And the way I explain this is that what's kind of unique, even though we think about how intelligent our software is, is that in the real world, we know that two solid objects cannot occupy the same place at the same, same space at the same time. Uh, an analogy that I would use here is, is, is if you had two stone cast, your upper and your lower cast, and you had wear facets. Well, you would put the model together looking at those wear facets, and you have wear facets because naturally that patient wore away until the teeth found that, that more intimate MIP, maximum interspace, intercuspation position or centric occlusion. And so what happens sometimes when you're doing the um, intraoral scanning, whether it's you or the assistant doing it, um, and I would suggest that revisit uh, some of the different companies have come up with some really good techniques and tips for scanning. Um, nothing harm with going back and do some remedial training on it because there's definitely some do's and don'ts when you're doing that scanning. And what can happen is if it's not the software will stitch images, the scans, I should say the scans together. But if there's too much information that's been missing, when it stitches the scans together, it doesn't recognize, as you see here, the purple is actually uh, superimposed where the teeth are inside the teeth, which is not physically possible, but in the digital world, it's possible. So um, the point is you can, if you see this, um, you know, take another uh, bite, uh, scan the bite one more time. And like I say, please, I encourage you to go back to your um, your uh, scanner manufacturer, um, go to YouTube. There's a lot of great information, good techniques that people have shared on YouTube as well. So I just wanted to share that with you because I would still suggest uh, doing 
hundreds of these cases going chair side myself personally, that why not take an extra couple of minutes and do a bite registration as well. Uh, Blue Moose works nice, sets up real fast uh, and send that in because it just gives us another reference point in case there was a problem with the scan. You don't have to bring the patient back. We don't get a delay. Um, so I really encourage you to think about, even though you wanna be all digital, the technology is improving every year, but very honestly, it's not 100% yet. Even the CT scans are not 100%. So um, there's nothing wrong with doing the analog uh, um, approach in conjunction with. I'm not saying it's mandatory for you to do that to work with in sequence. That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that with, with whoever you're working with, um, I would do that. I'd want someone to do that for me if it was for my, my parents, myself, uh, you know, a loved one. So hopefully that kind of shared a little information with you about that. Um, so as far as the, um, you know, the impressions, um, I mentioned already about the PBS material. What we do find is sometimes a lot of these patients do have uh, very uh, compromised dentition, very mobile dentition. And you may think that you're gonna do an extraction if you're using PBS. Um, so algin it's fine too. And just a tip for you, Sometimes it works really well if you're going to do an allergen impression, but the patient has a lot of periodontal disease and you have a lot of open embrasures and you know that those undercuts the impression material will get into. Um, believe it or not, a really easy, quick and easy uh, blackout material is uh, a wet Kleenex. I have to pack Kleenex in there because um, that'll help prevent the allergen material from going into those undercut areas. And if you leave anything in the mouth, it just dissolves and it's no harm, no foul. So um, I just wanted to share that one with you. So we're gonna talk a little bit more now about the um, scanning protocols and um, some, some tips and pearls with that. Always be sure and evaluate your scans before they're submitted. Many times the assistants are doing the CT scans for the patient, which is wonderful. Um, but you as a clinician should really take a look at it as well. Um, you know, it, just as a double check with your assistant to make sure that the quality of the scan is there. What we see happen sometimes when patient has uh, existing restorations, uh, the scatter uh, due to metal. And then another issue that we have is uh, movement or blurry where the scan is not really legible. Um, when we start going into segment it, from your CT scan, we're gonna go slice by slice all the way around the arch. So we're not looking at it from a topographical view. We're looking at your scan really from the inside out and from the outside in, you know, millimeter by millimeter going through that. So if you ever have a doubt, um, you can have what's called, we refer to as a scan review um, that from, I believe, Pacific time, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. If you were to reach out to the laboratory and let them know that you want to upload a CT scan, they're not going to tell you if the patient is a candidate for this type of a treatment modality. What they're going to do is just tell you if your scan is good or not. And um, that's very important, especially if patients are coming from a distance to see you. So sometimes we have patients too that might be nervous, you're concerned about just the patient movement and not talking about physical movement of their body, but really intraorally, um, maybe it's mild Parkinson's or just nervousness in the patients. You know, sometimes with the facial mask on elderly patients, you can't see your assistant is watching their head and their shoulders around the unit, make sure they don't bump it, but not really seeing it, noticing the patient is maybe actually, you know, kind of sliding their teeth back and forth. And that can create an issue. If you're concerned about that, a technique that works well is take a blue mousse material and just do a blue mousse bite registration. I refer to it as like a positioning jig. And then um, have the patient, you can scan the patient with that in place. You would use the chin rest at that time. You would not use the bite, bite fork. Um, we would prefer to have a CBCT scan taken with a bite fork or a tongue depressor, something to separate the teeth. However, when you have to weigh out the, you know, the pros and cons of 
of, of, of again with patient with movement or concern of movement, then um, this technique will work um, by having the patient in the chin rest and scan them with the bite in place to help minimize to hopefully eliminate uh, the blurry uh, potential. Uh, but again, it's preferred to have the patient utilizing the bite fork when you're scanning them. Um, if you've used a clusal splint for opening the patient's vertical, you, then you would scan that. Um, you know, you could either use the bite fork or have the patient close onto that splint and using the chin rest as well. So when we're looking at edentulous arch, it's we have what's called the dual scan protocol. And that means that we're going to be scanning the, the denture itself in the patient's mouth is one scan with the radiographic markers. And then the second scan is going to be the denture by itself. Um, and I'll show, share that in the next slide. As far as the scan markers, um, there's a lot of variety of scan markers out there. Some people use radiographic beads still. Um, you can use gutta percha. Um, but these are some scan markers that are stickers and they have a little radiographic bead here. What we're looking for is a total of six markers on an arch. We'd like to see three out onto the buckle, uh, posteriorly area, say about the first molar, somewhere where that beads around the neck of the, of the, of the tooth itself. Then we want one in the anterior, about the midline area. And then on the other side, we'd want another one in about that same uh, first molar area. Then three in the palatal or lingual, and that would be the uh, same scenario, same concept, but please have them a little offset. So you don't want your lingual or palatal bead to be directly opposing or opposite, I should say, opposite the one on the buckle. So in the scan, I'm sorry, in the, on your DICOM file, when the laboratory opens it up and they start extrapolating the scans, they use this, this triangulation of three reference points, X, Y, Z, and so they can clearly identify, okay, there's the, the lingual or palatal XYZ, here's the buccal XYZ to line scans up. And then what you see in the bottom, there's also some um, little stickers, um, markers that um, go, go over the teeth like a breathe right strip or like a butterfly Band-Aid. And that really helps to communicate to, um, to the laboratory real definitive position. They make them for centrals, laterals, canines, bys, and molars, just average size. But here you have a, a hard reference point between the alveolar ridge bony structure and the patient's denture. So if the patient if was wanting the teeth to be brought back maybe two millimeters or brought out or lengthened, this is very clearly, the lab has a reference point that you can communicate that to us and we'll know exactly uh, much more detail as to, to be, uh, to, I should say, to be more accurate and position that tooth. The other thing, um, when you're going to scan, prior to scanning it in the patient's mouth um, or even by itself, the first thing you're going to want to do is if the patient has uh, a good indicator that you need to do this is if they're wearing any fixident, uh, remove that. And you don't need to put any tray adhesive, but just do a wash impression and um, PBS uh, light body, medium body would be fine. And what you're seeing here is this particular patient, this, the more opacity here, the opaque is the actual impression material. And that's, you know, cause you're gonna scan this denture by itself. Plus we want it to fitting well in the patient's mouth during the scan. So uh, you don't need to reline the denture. Some people will go have a hard reline done. That's fine if you wanna do that. Um, but this is a good way to do it. It works very well and uh, very economical. So what you're seeing here is this was all picked up with the impression material. So now we'll have a really good accurate impression of that when you scan the denture by itself, and you'll have a good seeding of that and a good stability of that in the patient's mouth during the scan. So the dual scan protocol was one you're going to scan in the patient's mouth, and the second one, uh, the other scan is going to be where you're going to need to position the denture uh, on a box. Some people get a mail stand and, uh, you know, put a box and put the denture on it. The denture just needs to be in the same place as if it was in the patient's mouth in your unit. And you're literally going to scan the denture by itself. It doesn't matter if the teeth are up or teeth are down. Um, would suggest that you scan the denture first like this, then go to the mouth, simply because 
if the stickers weren't, you know, placed, if you're using the stickers, um, you know, they're nice and dry this way. Are uh, you going in the mouth? Sometimes a patient moving their lips might displace the sticker. So, um, you know, keep an eye on that too, if you're using these um, scan markers that are the stickers. So we've got our scans taken. We have our um, records for our models. And so now we're gonna record our vertical and um, our, you know, our bite, if you will, MIP. And so please, you know, keep in mind many of these patients that accepting this treatment, um, they have a collapsed or closed vertical and they need to be opened. And um, if you're opening a patient posteriorly, as, you, as I'm sure most of you know, that one millimeter over the first molar equates to about three millimeters in the anterior far as uh, opening on an arc. So opening a patient more than you know one to two millimeters posteriorly, um, you may need to have that patient in splint therapy because you'll need to deprogram and reprogram the musculature so that the patient can tolerate that new vertical. You don't want them to be doing that at the time of implant placement with a new provisional to all of a sudden try to open that patient's new vertical when the muscles are have not even been, like I say, deprogrammed or reprogrammed. Now you have freshly placed implants and the patient's lost a lot of their proprioception and they really don't know how hard they're biting. So this is very important that if you're gonna open a vertical up, you may need six to seven, eight weeks of that patient wearing a splint to make sure they can tolerate that uh, as well. So uh, just a note that this sometimes we see this happen, unfortunately, quite often, and it's more comp it's more um, it can complicate or put the implants at risk at the time of placement when a patient has doesn't have the the um, they're overclosing or trying to overclose with the masseters as strong as they are. So when we look at a patient that has an edentulous quadrant, um, here we have opposing edentulous quadrants, but uh, anything where, if you were to imagine if you had the models, so let's just say, even if you are doing all digital, just say if you had the patient's models, stone models in your hand, and if you were to try to put those, articulate those by hand, and you had an edentulous quadrant, and you were kind of going, well, I'm not sure exactly where that is. Let's see, lining up the wear for sets. You go, all right, that's it. There, there, that's my position right here. We don't, we won't do that. We can't do that. If we're off, like, like I said earlier, we could put harm, put your patient in harm's way. So just know that you're going to need to do um, an occlusal rim. And if you're doing an occlusal rim uh, in an edentulous quadrant like this, add a radiographic marker. So um, if you have like, you know, three teeth missing here posteriorly, just to be safe, put a radiographic marker on that occlusal rim. So we have our three points. We have one, two out here in the natural teeth. And then on the other side, not sure in this particular case what's on the other side. But just keep in mind, we need that three points of that tri triangulation to line up all the scans within the software. As a minimum, um, if you don't have the ability to make an occlusal rim, uh, as a minimum, a putty bite um, as a, so we know that and also mark, you know, the buckle on it or, you know, the clusal, just so there's no question about it. And then on that bite, that putty bite, again, a radiographic marker and then scan the patient with that putty bite or that clusal rim in place. So mentioned a little bit already about, you know, um, this possible splint therapy. On the scan itself, from your CT scan that you're taking, we're very limited to what we are comfortable in opening or closing a patient's vertical. We found too often when we try to open a vertical more than, you know, maybe, you know, more than one to two millimeters posteriorly digitally, it can throw things very off. And that means not just the bite being off, but it also can mean the trajectory of where the implants are being placed. So it's very important that you're utilizing um, you're, you're capturing the patient at the desired vertical for their final prosthesis when you're scanning. Now you've got all your data. Um, oh, I, I did want to say a little bit, if I'm sorry, I want to mention that if you're using occlusal rims, go ahead and mark that high lip line, that, that Duchenne smile. Um, then, you know, mark the midline, mark the canine eminence to help us know where the buccal corridor is, et cetera. So then with this data um, at the website, you can go, you see where every 
page you're on a website that has send a case button. You click on there, you click on the guided prosthetics, and it's a very intuitive protocol. It's about six steps to upload your cases with a zip file, and I'll walk you through all that on our site. Then what we're going to do is we're going to be um, digitizing uh, your records. If you send in analog information, we digitize it. If you send in digital information, we print it and we turn it into analog. So we work in both a, a digital analog world, again, for that cross-validation. So we're gonna do the segmenting, do the smile design with all the records, and we're gonna get ready for um, your go-to meeting. So what that means is that we're gonna go ahead, you don't have to buy any software, learn how to work with any software. Um, we're going to design the case based upon your prescription. Our designers know all about you know, AP spreads. Um, they're gonna understand about you know, looking for the bone density, they're gonna identify the bone density within the patient's arch. And you may find if you plan for four implants, they may set it up for five and they'll explain why. There's no additional cost to go five implants other than parts and pieces, but as far as what we're doing at the laboratory, we're designing your cases for optimum results for you and your patients. So the way a go-to meeting would go is just an example of it. Um, we'd encourage then that the surgical clinician and the restorative doctor be on this call. And the designers were gonna, some of them start by showing you the, the articulation, and they're going to basically just say that here's what we came up with. Does that look what your you know, doctor, is that what you recall how that patient's bite looks like? And then very importantly, especially for the restorative doctors, when you get to this point where the lab is um, talking about the new smile, as you kind of see it here, we see it in the white. Um, if there was something you were specifically looking for, your patients had a desire to, whether it's move the midline over, lengthen the teeth, bring the teeth further out. If you don't see it here, say something, because if you don't say anything, they're going to move forward with the case. So this is your time right now to make any kind of comments that you would like about changing the case, et cetera. And then they're going to also talk about the bone cut, uh, how much bone will be needed this particular case. Um, the average, I would say the average bone reduction for a patient with terminal dentition is three to five millimeters to get to that inner arch space for the prosthesis, which can range from anywhere from about 15 to 16 millimeters to about as low as uh, 12 millimeters. So based on the final prosthesis, that can affect the bone cut as well as the transition line can affect the, the bone cut or the amount of bone cut. Then the laboratory, we would already have set up all the implants. They're gonna go through this with you implant by implant. And you have the total control of having the laboratory um, move the implant, change the implant out. Uh, what you see is the green obviously is the implant, orange is the MUA abutment, the little pink is the outline of the bridge and the white of course is the teeth. So the go-to meeting then is gonna be recorded. So you could get a copy of that if you'd like for, for reference. From the go-to meeting then, uh, we start the process. So we're going to customize all of your, fabricate your models and your guides. It's going to arrive in a box. Everything's going to be labeled, as you see here in these denture boxes. Um, we're going to be including on your first case specific anchor pins um, for fixating what we call the bone foundation guide. So what we refer to as phase one is the day of surgery. Um, you're going to receive, you know, this is the model work that we printed. You'll notice that there's bases on these. On the prescription, it's going to ask you to list what articulator are you, semi-adjustable articulator are you using? I think we have about eight or 10 articulators on there. Um, so you can actually articulate the case when you get it back and you can do a dry model uh, surgery if you'd like and evaluate everything. You get your pre-op. This is a, as the patient's going to present. Uh, this is your bone cut model. This is going to represent um, how much bone is going to be removed. This is a what we call a, a, so a two supported monostrut. And then this is the key to the system. It's the bone foundation guide where uh, when, once that's seated, it's kind of like Legos for dentists, if you will. But key is getting that metal foundation guide in the right position, as you could imagine. Uh, additionally, we're going to have your surgical guides, the gasket, rotation guides, start bites. And we are going to provide you with two provisional, um, long term provisionals. And then the, each implant site, we're going to order the prosthetic components on whosoever account you tell us. Um, we're going to order it from the implant manufacturer you're working with. It's going to be drop shipped to in sequence 
Uh, we don't mark any parts up. So whatever discounts you get, you get. Um, we're going to tell you what implants are needed. Um, we do not order the implants for you. So that will be something you want to order the implants as well as backup implants. So what you're going to get is one multi-unit abutment, two temporary copings with the small little prosthetic screws, and then two customized blackout plugs. That's for each implant site. That's all going to be shipped um, to whoever you indicate the case to go to. The temporaries are milled from a uh, the teeth themselves are monolithic. They're milled from a, a PMMA pup. And then the base itself is printed from a carbon printer with the uh, uh, dense fly lucitone uh, material that's designed specifically for the printers. And then we will go ahead and bond those teeth into the, uh, to the base of the bridge. You're also going to get a multitude of reports. You're going to get photos of your case. You're going to get the bone density charts, the drilling charts, et cetera. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at the day of surgery. You're going to have a surgical setup. Here's um, your guides are all been floated, if you will, in uh, chlorhexidine for some cold sterilization. Then we need a little setup for finishing the bridge. Um, so the overview really on the day of surgery, there's 10 things that we're going to be doing. And I'm going to uh, kind of run through these here fairly quickly. Uh, we have this in more detail on our website as well. Uh, this evening is more of just kind of a cursory overview. What's really nice to do with all these charts is you put them up on the wall, make some notes on them. Uh, it's good visual reference to keep everyone on, on the same page. So this particular patient we're going to look at, um, the first thing we'll always want to do is a start bite. So the patient prior to being sedated, very importantly to our specialist, you want the patient sitting upright. Uh, and not sedated. So like I usually say, right when they come out of the restroom, sitting up, try the start bite in. And what we mean by that is this start bite, we fabricated, it's a hard replica, hard replica of the rest of the bite you sent in. And so what we're doing here is we're just kind of having the patient tap, tap into it. We don't want to guide them into it. We're just holding it on the side, have the patient tap into it. And it's not a go, no go, but especially when we do a bone supported mono strut, uh, where we're using the patient's occlusion to position that bone foundation guide, it's important to know how this occlusion was. If it was off on the start bite, it'll be off on that mono strut. And it's important that you're aware of that so you don't misposition uh, that mono strut. We're going to give you a chart to tell you what teeth, if we're going to do, we prefer to try to do whenever possible, what we call a tooth supported mono strut. And so uh, we're going to give a set a eight by 10. It's going to tell you of all the teeth, ex, it's a selective extraction. Extract all the teeth for this particular case. You're going to retain seven and 10. Um, so what we're doing here, this particular case I'm showing you, really did have a significant amount of bone reduction. It's usually, um, you know, uh, three to five millimeters as far as bone reduction. The reflection of your tissue needs to usually be about two millimeters past the bone foundation guide. So a two supported mono strut is exactly that. We're going to use a, utilize a tooth to seat onto the, the mono strut onto that tooth. The mono strut is pinned to the metal guide here. And then versus its, it's a, a other option is a bone supported. So this is for a dentalist patient or for patients that have dentition that is too mobile to rely on for consistency and positioning that two supported mono strut. The difference here is that uh, here you see the full occlusion. This is where this type of case, you definitely would want to make sure you did check the start bite uh, because if that was off, you'd want to know that going into this case. And these struts will sit onto the actual bony alveolar ridge. Both of these are representing the actual alveolar ridge. Tissue has been reflected, what you're seeing here, represented on the model. Clinically, in the mouth, the two supported, we're making sure that the metal guide is touching over the alveolar ridge, metal to bone, both sides, and the teeth are nice, uh, seating nicely into the guide. For the bone supported, here we are looking at the occlusion, uh, making sure that that's how it was in the start bite, and then metal to bone here, as well as the strut touching the alveolar ridge, that's actual bone, not tissue there. So that's the two options. And then this is what it looks like when you go in the mouth with it. We've connected the mono strut and the bone foundation guide together. Tissue has been reflected. You see the palatal has been tied back. The flap has been tied back. Um, 
this did go quite nicely. Sometimes you may have to reduce a little bit on the bone, maybe even do a, you can do a little bit on the inside of that bone foundation guide uh, a little bit if you're hitting a little bit from maybe when you did your extractions, you try to go for HMAC extractions, but possibly uh, you ex that tooth expanded the bone uh, buccally or lingually or palatally. Um, so here we're just checking our teeth to support a monostrut not only is it the teeth here, but we also put a belt and suspenders. We put one of the strut touching the anterior. If ever this happens to be touching the ridge prior to the teeth, just relieve the inside of this. Sometimes in the scan, it we can't really get 100% perfect on that bone, especially in a softer bone. So if that's hitting premature, don't hesitate to go ahead and relieve the underside of this one strut. And we're utilizing the teeth to give us a real definitive position. So with, the, with that seated, then you're going to utilize the 1.5 drill and the, um, it's a 20 millimeter length drill, go all the way to depth for sure. And then you're gonna insert the anchor pin. We've already done these other two here. And now we're, you see the finger is holding the guide up into position just to secure it. Now we have it secured with all three anchor pins. So the pins are removed. You can actually look at the bone cut model and see that the bone cut is a should be a really exact replica of what you see in the mouth. Uh, many clinicians, I think it's a good idea before you drill and pin is to hold up your bone cut model to the mouth and say, you know, take some measurements. Is that the same distance you see in the mouth that you see here? Maybe the flaps caught underneath this uh, bone foundation guide. Maybe it's caught between the metal uh, the buckle plate and the bone foundation guide. So there's a lot of ways that we can help to you know, you can help to verify that it's seated properly. Then you're going to do is you're going to reduce the bone from the flat of the buckle to the flat of the palatal. Uh, many clinicians will use a large, uh, really like an, a large acrylic burr. Some will use a piezo unit, some use reciprocating saw, some use back action rongiers and particulate some of that bone, use it into the bone graft. Um, either way, what you want to do is just get that bone so it's nice and flush from the buckle to the palatal. So we've eliminated the question about where, how much bone to reduce and at what angle. So what we're doing here now, it's very easy. You can just take a perio probe, a metal one that's gonna give you a better tactile feel than a plastic. And you're just feeling for any high spots. If you hit a high spot here, just relieve that. So now that we've got our bone reduction, then we're going to place the surgical guide. Um, the surgical guide will seat um, the, very exactly the same way that the monostrut was seating. So the same pins that were holding the monostrut to the bone foundation guide, we're going to be utilizing those pins to secure the surgical guide in place. This is where that phrase stackable guide comes in. So um, what you're gonna see here, um, we are now using metal pins, but we're, this video is still showing a plastic pin, but there's three of these extensions that kind of lap over the outside of the bone foundation guide is how you secure that. And you see the surgical guide, uh, the implant site numbers are numbered in blue. We also have a reference line for orientation. The surgical guide needs to be able to control the depth of the implant and the rotational or the timing position of the implant. So that when you're placing the implant through the surgical guide, we've designed the sleeve to be at the right position for depth control. And then it's up to you to get the rotational control, uh, the rotational position of the timing correct. X with that blue line. Uh, we'll take photos of that, of your case and we will send that along in your packet. So we'll have photos of that that'll be sent along in your packet as an eight by 10 reference too. So now the implants have been placed, you remove the surgical guide, and now you're evaluating for bone profiling. Um, to place these angled multiple multi-unit abutments can be a little challenging. So we fabricate a guide that's a visual aid. We have a blue line here. And so you line up the uh, screw, the abutment screw, the multi-unit abutment to the blue line to help get you the orientation. And you know you're in the right spot when that, as you see right here, that screw head is right pointing at the blue line. And especially when the driver of your, um, the driver goes into that abutment screw and properly seated, that shaft of that driver will go right over the blue line. And then again, 
what you'll notice is that carrier, the little uh, carrier to take the multi-unit from the bench to the mouth should look like a fence post when you look at it from the buckle. That way you know in the right position. Straight abutments are very, uh, very easy to do. Most manufacturers either have a pop-off little carrier where you just screw it in. Some may have a little screw attached to it. Either way, they just screw in. Um, and then once it stops with these carriers, you just um, get it finger tight and then you just snap the little carrier off. Sorry about that. And then um, tighten up all the, your, your angled abutments, your straight abutments with the appropriate drivers to the appropriate torque. Now we're getting ready to um, pick up the bridge. So we find that it's best that when you're placing the temporary copings or temporary cylinders that onto the multi-unit abutments, so just place two first. I like to personally start on one side of the arch or the other, it doesn't matter which one, but I like to start in a posterior, put two on and just slide the bridge on. You see the extensions on that bridge, the, the arms, they're gonna go in the same place where the surgical guide was. And we're just making sure that we don't have anything hitting uh, on the bridge. This particular one, we're a little snug. We could probably use a little relief just to have room for the material. So it's not a problem. You just take a little burr and maybe relieve a little bit of that. Sometimes you don't need to do any relief. Then we've got all the copings on. We've tried the bridge on. Now we provide you a tissue gasket that actually is uh, acts as a rubber dam. And then you want to seat this completely uh, onto the alveolar ridge. And then that is going to be, uh, sorry, that'll be seated in place. And then the bridge will seat on top of that. And then again, the same pins that were used, again, we'll be using the metal pins. You're going to be using the metal pins to secure that bridge to the frame. Once again, I think you're seeing that this how important it is to get the bone foundation guide in the right position. So now we've got that um, secured in place. Now the next thing is we're going to do is we're going to loot or bond the temporary cylinders or copings to the bridge. The blackout plugs we, we provided are inserted into the copings. There are injection holes pre-drilled on the buckle. What you see here is we're taking a perio probe and as the material has been injected from the buckle, the perio person with the perio probe is just encouraging the material around the cylinder, popping in the air bubbles, et cetera. And you complete that with each of them. Then once you have that, you're going to remove the prosthetic screws. You're going to remove the pins that are holding the bridge in place. And this is actually in real time coming out. Now, as far as the conversion, for those of you that have done the conventional way, um, our conversion is really not much more than to go ahead and backfill these little voids here, remove these arms, fill in these little blockout holes if need be. So let's take a look at that. Uh, oh, first, I want to do this. We want to do the second bridge, pick that up on the day of surgery. Surgeons, for you, you may think, well, you know, you're kind of, maybe this has gone on a little bit longer than you anticipated. Um, you don't see the value in picking up the second bridge. I can say this, that if you take the extra, it almost always is about eight to 10 minutes to pick up the second bridge. That is going to save your restorative doctor probably about three to four appointments to make the final prosthesis. So this is a huge benefit for your patient. They have less appointments. And it's really important for your restorative doctors. It's, it simplifies the process for them. They don't have to go through denture protocols to make the final with the clusal rims, tri-ins, et cetera. So go ahead and place the second set of copings, place the tissue gasket, repeat that with the bridge, pick that up. And again, what that's going to do is going to really, that second bridge is going to eliminate or combine a lot of these, all these steps into, into really one appointment. Now that you've picked up both bridges, you can put the little healing caps on top of the uh, multi-unit abutments, remove the bone foundation guide by removing those three long anchor pins, and then you can suture around those healing caps. While you, the clinician, surgical clinician is doing that, then the restorative doctor is finishing off the, um, you don't have to finish both provisionals. You just wanna finish one that the patient's gonna wear. The other one, you have months to finish that one. Uh, that's gonna be used on the final, on the first appointment for the restorative procedure. So here we are, we're still the day of surgery. 
the surgeon, the clinician is closing, uh, bone grafting and closing as necessary, then what we need to do here, um, all your, what I've done so far here, I've just washed the blood off. Um, I've dried it. I added the black blackout plugs back onto the bridge. And so these are the four areas that I need to address. And this is done very quickly. You just cut off the extensions. You take an acrylic burr um, and you just do some blending of whatever you have left on that. Um, to fill in on the occlusal, I think that personally, I like to go ahead and use some matching Flobo uh, composite, like a shade A1, whatever the, the teeth are. Uh, where the screw access holes come out the occlusal, give the patient something nice instead of just pink there. Uh, so we're going to fill in those, uh, both of the occlusal access holes with some Flobo. And then we're going to come in with some of our pink material and we can just flow that in around, making that nice and flush for the patient on the integulo side. Then we're going to also go ahead and just fill in those little voids. And again, it's just about blending it, polishing it. Um, and the idea is that you're going to give the patient now a prosthesis that is, you know, especially if you have a lathe in a practice, if you're doing very many of these cases, they have mi little miniature lathes that are really nice to be able to do pumice and high shine and make something really nice for your patient. But here the healing caps have been removed and now we're seating the bridge onto the healing caps. Uh, this particular clinician, clinician liked to put the screws already into the bridge. Uh, otherwise, you can just attach the screw to your driver and seat it like you would a tire on a car, one side crossing over to the next, finger tighten. A little tip for you, if you tighten it, back it up half a turn just to, just to give a little bit of play in it to help get all the screws in place, then come back and final tighten it. Very minimal occlusal adjustment the day of. Um, mainly, I suggest that you just hit the high spots if the patient's hitting where you've added on the occlusals. Their bite at this point may not be... Um, you know, because of their just fatigue, maybe even some swelling, they may not be able to close into their, you know, their proper bite position. So typically you see them post-op and make the final adjustments to expedite dismissing the patient instead of Teflon. You can use Teflon if you'd like. Um, you can use, you know, some blackout material um, as well. Uh, here we're just showing, it works pretty quick to just take some light body PBS uh, this is going to do fine for a week or so, but you can dismiss the patient very quickly. You just want to plug those little holes up. You wipe the material. And then the idea is that the patient is leaving then with their new smile. And then this is what it's all about, taking them from where they were to having them with a nice new smile. And then very quickly, it'll take me just a couple minutes to go through this to now let's fast forward through integration has taken place. You've probably seen the restorative doctor. You've probably seen the patient a couple of times, check their home care, check their occlusion, but now you're ready to fabricate the final prosthesis. So to my specialist friends out there, this is where picking up that second bridge is huge for your restorative doctors, huge value for them. It's a practice builder for you when you can offer this your restorative doctors to be able to do a final prosthesis, literally possibly in two one-hour appointments. And I'll share that with you right, right now. So that second bridge eliminates doing all these uh, po potentially separate appointments. So that really what we're going to do is commonly, if you don't need to do a try-in, it's gonna be two appointments. Uh, the first appointment would be your final uh, impression and a bite registration. And then you're going to deliver the backup uh, denture, I'm sorry, the backup bridge. And then the second appointment would deliver the final. Your third appointment, if you would like, or uh, your optional second appointment would be a try-in. So let's take a look at this because this is very straightforward and very, very, quite honestly, very easy. Um, it's about a one hour appointment. So you can either take the backup denture that's been sitting there for several months and already go ahead and ahead of time, Relieve a one to two millimeters off of that alveolar, uh, off the integral side of that. That's going to give the space for the impression material because we're going to inject the material underneath that. Then you would take and apply some tray adhesive after you've done that. The other option is you could use the existing, and some people will like to do this. They've really fine tuned the occlusion. And so what you would do then is remove the existing bridge they've been wearing 
do the same thing, relieve that integral side uh, a couple of millimeters here, one to two millimeters, tray adhesive, and then you would reseat that, either one, whether it's the backup or the existing one, you're gonna reseat that. And then what you're going to do using, uh, I think medium body you're gonna find is probably gonna be most advantageous. But notice the syringe tip starting in the very posterior, putting the syringe tip here and injecting until you see it come out to the palate and just work in and out, in and out, in and out as you go through around the arch. I think it's best if you start posteriorly, work up to the midline and then do the same on the other side, start posterior, work up, watching it come in from through the palatal or lingual area. Then finally take a nice big bead uh, impression along the peripheral borders to capture that transition line. And you wanna go over the hamular notch or the retromolar pads, palatally make sure you capture that, lingually make sure you get a nice bead there as well. Then what you're going to do, and we're almost done, is you're going to take a new bite registration. Now that could be a scan bite if you'd like, or a physical bite. Always a new opposing. Something may have happened, those teeth may have shifted since the last you know, appointment, the last time the models were, impressions or models were done. So new impression opposing, new bite, uh, photos if need be, and then uh, fill out the prescription to the laboratory. And then the next appointment would be deliver the final prosthesis. And that's just gonna be a normal protocol for doing that. If you had a try-in, you would just, you know, remove the bridge, that, the temporary, the provisional I've been wearing and try, you know, the, the try-in in um, and make any adjustments or notations about that. We also can do a milled try-in. It would be all white that the patient could actually wear for a week or so if they wanted to fine tune their, if you're fine tuning their occlusion or they wanted to make sure they were happy with the, the position, the teeth, FNS, phonetics, et cetera. So the last thing I have is this slide, which is going to be um, a quick look at what the final restorations are. In fact, I will probably go, uh, this is where we're gonna go a little bit more in depth because this is gonna go onto the website. Uh, I'm gonna take you through each one of these. Uh, apologize for running over a little bit. Uh, a lot of information to try to cover in a short period of time. So we have really four different types of primary options, uh, the denture teeth and acrylic, a hybrid uh, with a titanium bar, zirconia, nanoceramic is a very popular one as well. And then what you see here is a, uh, we call it a thimble bar where we've, we've designed all the preps and these are individual crowns. So um, real quickly, the denture teeth, the hybrid denture teeth, it's what we've had for you know many years. Um, there are some you know advantages to that, um, some disadvantages as well. You do need more inner arch space for this type of uh, prosthesis. So that's going to be the maximum looking around 15 to 16 millimeters of inner arch space. Um, it is less abrasive to the opposing, which could be beneficial. Downside is its teeth can fracture off because they are denture teeth, uh, can stain because it's basically a denture, if you will. Um, so we're seeing people doing a lot, you know, getting away from those, going to something like here, uh, the monolithic zirconia. Now we have a beautiful pucks that are multi-layered. They look very aesthetic. Uh, with monolithic zirconia, um, you have advantages, you know, uh, um, about um, strength, you know, the aesthetics, um, hygiene, it's easier for a patient to maintain this. You wanna think about the opposing. If you're doing double arch monolithic, I mean, zirconia to zirconia can be pretty noisy as you see here in our drawback. Um, it can be fairly heavy for some patients on the lower arch, especially. Um, you can't reline it. So uh, you want to make sure that the tissues are completely healed and the patient's doing a good job on their home care. Then the one that we also see a lot of popularity with is the nano ceramic. Um, this nano ceramic, the way this is fabricated, the bar, instead of a titanium bar, this is a material called Trilor. And this is a uh, PMMA that's impregnated with uh, nano uh, particles, ceramic particles, and um, it's very strong. So we'll design the bar, we mill the bar from a puck, and then we scan that. And then what you're seeing here is the inside, if you will, think about that as being like a, a, a night guard on the clusal side down on the table, but that will fit right up over onto that bar. We will bond that at the laboratory. And then we've already, the teeth, they will be polished. They're already milled. You can't see it here. These have just been polished. The pink is hand done. That is a lab 
lab light cured material that we hand do that. So you have the trilor bar, you have the nano ceramic, uh, the crystal ultra is the actual, the teeth and the framework for the, uh, the, the gums, if you will. And here, we, what people like a lot about this is that, you know, it is repairable if the patient was to chip a tooth. I've actually relined a couple of the cases. Um, it's, uh, it's kinder. If you're doing a zirconia, a lot of people do zirconia on the upper, on a double arch, and then do a nano ceramic on the lower. Um, the downside is that the, there is an optoglaze that the laboratory will put on it at the time of delivering it. That might need to be reapplied after a year or two years. Um, it's very simple to do. It's just a paint on, but it's a little light cure unit that you would um, you would need to have to to cure that light. It's hard to do it with a little little wand. And then the last one, and I'm almost done with my presentation here, is the what we call the thimble bar, which is actually going to be 12 individual zirconia crowns that we cement onto the bar. That pink is the same material that is being utilized on a nano ceramic. We'd opaque all that. We would hand place that and design the uh, gingival contours, but the teeth are gonna be uh, cemented onto the bridge and you would just have the, your screw access holes uh, to deal with. This is just showing a bridge where the material called pecton is, instead of titanium. Some people are utilizing this. We see it used maybe only about five to 10% of the time. It's more of a kind of a metal free type of consideration. Um, this is the most aesthetic that you're gonna get with individual crowns. Um, so it's, it's beautiful that way. And uh, so that's what we have, a little more detail with that. You wanna learn more information if you go to our website where you see the red box that says education, you'll, the drop down. if you look at Virtual Learning Academy, uh, you click on that, there'll be a drop down, and then here you can click on on-demand seminars, and uh, we have a variety of them, and we're continuing to update them as we go. I would like to say thank you so much for your attention, and we appreciate your interest.